Welcome to the start of our virtual tour of the battlefield of Waterloo. I'm standing on the crest of the ridge where Wellington's army faced Napoleon. I got a wonderful span of the horizon with Hougoumont Farm out on the west, out to La Belle Alliance where Napoleon had his headquarters, to Plansonois over the hill on the skyline there where the Prussians famously entered into the fray and tipped the balance in favour of the Allies. And further round, we've got Mont Saint-Jean, where Wellington famously had his hospital. Now in the past, we've actually found amputated limbs of some of those who fought at Waterloo, but this year we've got one better. We've got a complete skeleton of one of the combatants. With a bit of luck with future analysis, we'll be able to tell how old this person was and perhaps how he died. The important thing is that we, were we are using veterans, people who fought in the modern army who can relate to those who fought at Waterloo. So join us as we go on our virtual battlefield of these crucial trenches and at the same time don't forget have a little look at that banner at the bottom of the screen. Please do donate. We do need your support financially to help us continue this work. Okay, let's get started. We've got a bit of a car journey to start with and first thing we're going to do is move from Wellington's line across the French front lines to Pansonois. And as we're going through the countryside, we'll be passing through where the French attacked and where the battle ebbed and flowed. It's, it's quite a, just a gently rolling landscape. It looks very attractive now. But remember in those days, the whole battle had just been fought after a torrential rainstorm. It would have been an absolute quagmire. So now I'm gonna sit back and just enjoy the journey. Well, here we are on the next phase of our virtual tour of the Waterloo battlefield. And I've got with me here, Michelle and Jamie, who although they're veterans, have actually participated in the background research of the action at Plansonois, where we are. Michelle, what can you tell me about the Prussian advance? Where do they come from? Okay, Phil, they actually came from over there and they advanced this way. Now, that's not the, the way that they should have advanced. They planned to advance coming from this way, but there was a lot of rain the night before, so therefore it was all ended up like bog. So Napoleon was waiting here, expecting to, for the Prussians to come across that ridge, but they didn't. The Prussians came this way, which actually came up the, at the back of Napoleon and the back of his battalions. So they're virtually outflanking them. Oh yes. Definitely. So Jamie, how did you get involved in this and, and what have you actually found out? Well I, I got involved through the virtual programme in 2020 um, and what I found out was about Plants and Moi was really very key to the battle. It was late in the afternoon, um, the, the Prussians were coming from the east, they had to divert and come more from the south and east, which meant that they were basically coming right up Napoleon's backside. Um, <laughs> you really like that, don't you? <laughs> and, and the key was, it, it forced Napoleon, although Napoleon was a bit further over in the actual bat main battlefield, it forced him to divert some of his troops to come and defend Plansonois because he knew if it, if it fell into the Prussian hands, the, the, the game was over. He was, he was then having to fight on two fronts, back and front, um, and, and so that's why this, this battle was absolutely key. And I believe the actual fighting in the village was very vicious hand to hand. Yes, there, were, there was something in the end of like 45,000 troops in this one small village, so you can imagine a football stadium full of people fighting it out. Um, and that's it normal. Would, it would, <laughs> <laughs> and it would have been utter hell. Um, just hand-to-hand -hand fighting in, in narrow streets, very hard to identify each other because they were wearing very similar uniforms and the smoke and fog of war would have just made it awful. But while you've been here, you've been able to, to do actually a little bit of excavation. What's your favourite find? Well, my, my personal favourite find was, I didn't find it myself, but I was right beside the trench when we pulled out a flattened musket ball, so it, it has hit something and I think Michelle had something else. What did you find then, Michelle? Well, we were digging and found this sort of silver sort of thing poking through the sand. And all of a sudden I thought, oh, it's a musket ball. <laughs> I got excited 
And then it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it ended up to be part of a spoon, uh -huh. which was quite of a shock because I was looking for battlefield stuff, and to get a spoon meant these are human beings that are fighting each other. It put, brought the human element to the battlefield. They were sat here eating their, you know, their supper. That, that Michelle, is what archaeology is mm. all about. People and great stories. Mm. And I mean, although I haven't dug here, I, I can visualise, to me, a great mm. story because I know we've been doing uh, metal detecting searches in this field and we've been finding musket mm. balls. Mm. I bet you, I don't know the checks, but I bet you they're mainly French musket balls yes. mm. coming out from Pantinois and that basically the Prussians are advancing across mm. open country. Mm -hmm. They must have been going into an absolute hailstorm of musket mm. shot. Oh, yes, definitely. And that, to me, sums up an incredible picture of bravery and courage as mm. they are advancing on that village mm. and the actual fighting that they've got to go through when they get there. Oh, yeah. yes, they couldn't see the smoke from the fires that were started. And every time you fire a musket, smoke comes up. So they couldn't see a thing. And, of course, muskets aren't uh, very accurate. So you have to be straight in front of you to actually aim and fire and actually get somewhere. See, direct from the horse's mouth, eh? Stuart, this is technically, I suppose, my first ever visit to Blanton Wild. And, and I mean, I've seen it on the maps, I've, I've seen it in the pictures and all the rest of it. And it's very, very close mm -hmm. to Wellington's front line. And yet now I'm standing here, I am so disorientated that I got no idea where Wellington was. Where on earth was Wellington's line? Yeah, so it's a bit difficult here because we're in a kind of bowl. Exactly. So, Wellington's line is up over here. Right. So we follow this road up and we go all the way up to uh, Mont Saint-Jean, basically, all the way at the end there. The French are now basically in this village here of plants -et noir so they're sort of railed along actually in the village itself, just around the uh, church there as well, but also lined up along this road behind these modern houses. Right. But then the interesting thing about plants -et noir is that at the end of the battle, towards the end of the day, the Prussians start coming through. They are the trump card. Exactly. This is where the battle really just changes and, uh, and Napoleon's in big trouble. And they're coming in on the French flank. So where are they coming in from? So they're coming in from over here. So what they're trying to do is basically come behind the French lines and blocking off, uh, blocking off no, uh, Napoleon's retreat, so, and then rolling him up this way. So they're coming in like just to the just to the left of those woods. Exactly, just to the left of those woods, and then uh, two corps, two corps come through there, and then another load come through over here. So they're coming in a kind of pincer movement round the either side of the woods. So for any Frenchman over here, that must have been quite a shock. Absolutely, and they totally weren't expecting it either. So, so they saw troops coming over. Did, were they at any point thinking that they might have been their own French troops? Exactly, so of course Napoleon at this point is like, don't worry lads, here comes Grouchy, who's got a whole load of troops, should be coming from that direction because Grouchy is chasing the Prussians. So he tell, Napoleon tells his troops, Grouchy's coming, hooray, everyone's all right. They all get excited, they start running over there and then they get shot at by the Prussians. So this is a crucial part of the battle. Absolutely. And, and it, it, to me, it is so different from Waterloo, which has got that lovely open ridge. That's exactly Whereas right. here, like you say, we're only a mile or so away from it. And yet the, the, the ground level have totally changed. You've got these almost, they're much better. I guess they must be better from a military point of view to mm -hmm. fight in. Yeah, although the fighting here is very different because when the Prussians actually come in, they're fighting street to street, house to house, hand to hand. This is bayonet charges. This isn't people standing up in lines firing like on the rest of the battlefield. This is real dirty fighting. So now we've got, for the first time, Waterloo has got for the first time, the chance to do archaeology in the village. Exactly. And for something which was so concentrated, but so vicious, you must have found some evidence of the battle. You'd hope so, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, but here we are, we're now talking about the archaeology here, and the archaeological story of these fields is quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> so, on the rest of the battlefield, when we do metal detecting, a lot of the um, soil has been ploughed. Yep. So as you put the plough in, everything that's underneath gets turned over, musket balls pop up, and um, as you'll see, 
uh, up, up at Mont Saint Jean. There's, there's hundreds of these things. In these particular fields, which we've been allowed into by the local farmer, these have always been under pasture. So they haven't really been ploughed in the past, which means anything that was dropped during the battle has got 200 years of cows walking over it and shoving it in, but it hasn't actually been turned over. So we ran a metal detector over this field, hoping to find these hundreds of Prussian and French musket balls. Nothing. Nothing from the battle at all in this particular field which was a bit of a surprise and a bit of a disappointment. I can't help but notice, I mean, you've obviously done these holes by hand. Mm -hmm. I mean, would it benefit to do a bigger area? It would, and I wish we could. Um, and in fact, on the rest of the uh, other places in the battlefield, when we've scraped back, for instance, at Hougamon, as you may see, we scrape back a lot of the soil there. And as you take the pasture off, you get down to those battle layers and the metal detecting comes up trumps. So, have you found absolutely nothing? We have found some things in the next field, um, and there's a reason for that, I think. Now, it's a bit difficult to see, but this field here has a sort of terrace right. in it. You can see that. So it's flat in the middle, and then it gets terrace, uh, slopes up to the fence line, and then slopes off there. When we did the metal detecting in here, we had lots of metal signals up against that fence line. We excavated one of them, and it was a kind of big dump of stuff, pottery and glass, bits of metal, which sort of makes us think that they've scoured the field back, pushed everything over to make this flat. Under. You say you found something in the other field. What have you got there? Yeah, so in this other field, which is a very different type of field to this one, there hasn't doesn't look like it's been terraced. We went in there, you know, first two minutes of metal detecting we came up with two French musket balls and we've got about 25 or 30 musket balls from there along with buckles and everything else that you would normally find. So, of Napoleonic of Age. Of Napoleonic Age, exactly. So when I'm over at, at um, uh, on the, the main battlefield, Wellington's mm -hmm. battlefield, yeah. I know that the bore of the British musket was larger than the French ones. Correct. So we can then discern which are British balls and which are French balls. Can we tell the difference between French and Prussian muskets? Yes, we can. So Prussian musket balls are slightly bigger than British musket balls. So um, it's a slightly bigger calibre. However, we haven't found any Prussian musket balls yet. So we can't exactly compare them, but the 1809 Prussian musket had a slightly bigger calibre. Uh, so it's a bit like the Brown Bess, which is the British one. So we should be able to tell the difference. But the, me the message is that you've only been here for a few days. Exactly. You will keep looking. Exactly. You know, I can't come to Waterloo and not go to Hougamon. So I've uh, I persuaded them that we might have a slight navigational error and just pop in, just for old time's sake. You know I'm gonna love to be back there. Well, the moment I've been waiting for, a chance to get back to Hougamont and revisit some of my favorite old memories. Let's see if I can get in. No, Emily, yeah. <laughs> my old mate, Emily, we can share our memories together. Come yeah. on. Come on. It's been really nice, really nice to come back to Hougamont. This is the first time I've visited this year. In fact, it's been three years actually, of course, since we were here at all. Um, and it's been, it's been absolutely lovely. The day is perfect. Yeah. The quiet, the noise, the calm. That's how it is now. But when we were here, cro, you yeah. know, well, the noise I, of tools, well, digging, chatter. When I looked at the when I looked at the itinerary of where we were gonna be digging and Hougamont was not on it, and I thought, oh what? I won't be able to go back there. But I knew I'd be able to wangle it sooner or later. <laughs> what I put it is, there's a piece of my soul in this farm. There mm -hmm. really is. And, you know, yes, there's a piece of my soul in here. Maybe one day we'll get you a plaque. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Emily. It's been really a great pleasure to share my memories and hear your memories of our time together in Hougamont Farm. Mm. But 
I'm afraid I've got a pressing engagement now, so I've got to get on for more of the virtual tour. Come on, guys. Well, what do you think of that then? That was pretty smart, wasn't it, eh? But uh, now we're on the way back, and this is the one I've really been looking forward to, hearing what, and actually seeing these wonderful finds that they've been making at Mont Saint-Jean. I don't think we're going to be disappointed. Charlie, you're one of the founders of Waterloo Uncovered. You're also a serving military uh, officer. Um, but what I wonder is, when you look at Waterloo Uncovered, do you see it as an archaeologist or as, a, as, a, as, an, uh, as an avenue for charity work? And the answer, Phil, is both. Um, although. As you know, I'm a very much lapsed archaeologist, um, having not really, until this project got going, not really practised it for a long time. Uh, and I think that those around will probably recognise that I'm not, not doing too much shovelling at the moment. Um, but it's absolutely fascinating. Of course, the wonderful thing about archaeology is that it's such a wide discipline. There are so many avenues down which one can go that it's suitable for people from all sorts of backgrounds. And that includes mm. people with varying degrees of physical disability, um, people with different, perhaps, uh, demands emotionally, mentally, um, and, and different interests. So really sell it to me then. What, why archaeology? Why is that so good as a charitable aid? Archaeology is it's an outdoor activity, it's a group sport, it's something that, um, uh, that, that brings people together in a shared endeavour. But most importantly, we're not just sort of sitting in a you know, bar full of baked beans trying to raise money for something. We're actually pursuing knowledge and the idea of interacting with this incredible landscape, this battle that is so important to so many of us in all sorts of different ways, um, that in itself is, is a draw. And the idea that you can participate in that is... You clearly feel this very passionately, the benefits of archaeology as, yes. and, and the work that, the, that Waterloo can do as a charity. I've seen firsthand at just how beneficial it can be because I've been here. How do you sell that to ordinary people in the street? That's a really interesting question. And I think the, this idea of sort of human interaction with the landscape, with the past... Um, there's a fascination, I think, for all of us that you, know, you walk these fields and you imagine, you know, if you had X-ray vision, what could you see underneath? Who's been here before and what have they done? And you know, I think that, that applies wherever archaeology is going. Here we're talking about a battle, a very famous battle. Um, but you know, we walk across Salisbury Plain and, and as we know, there are things, people, activities under our feet all the time. And I think a lot of people out there have a real fascination with, with, with just touching the past. Um, and our great privilege, of course, is that we get to do that here. That's why archaeology is such a powerful, um, is such a powerful um, thing around which to hang these activities. So, you're convinced, I'm convinced. It works. It does what it says on the tin. Please, you viewers watching this virtual tour, please be convinced. Help us to raise money to continue this valuable work. If you need a reminder, have a look at the banner on the bottom of the screen and please use it to donate to the charity. Well, I've finally arrived and it has been worth the wait. Vero, what on Hello. earth have you got here? So we have found several uh, horses. Horses? Yes, that dated from the, the Battle of, the, of Waterloo. So uh, this is quite an amazing find. Have you ever found anything like this before? No, not for Waterloo uh, Battlefield. I mean, that, so what we've got here then is a complete horse. We have a complete horse. Uh, it seems that the iron uh, horseshoes so have we've been got... removed. So oh. careful. There's, there's the head. The, the, the four limbs, the rest of it, and the hind limbs. And you say you've, you've got uh, horseshoes as well? No, we haven't found them. So it seems they were removed before burying the, the horses. When looking at it in the ground, it looks, I don't know, it looks a bit small. I mean, it looks almost like a pony. It's, yeah, there are small horses, maybe some mules, but we still have to make all uh, the observation in the labs to uh, be able to say which, which kind, which kind of... Uh, can you say how it died? No, not for the moment, unfortunately. 
we may we may find something uh, if we found some uh, musket balls maybe or a wound uh, fracture or something we may have some clue uh, on how he died because this is the area that produced the the, the amputated limbs when we were last yes, here it is indeed so this this horse is is pretty much in exactly the same layer it is in the same pit more than a layer it's the same layer at the bottom of a pit and um, what we have here is uh, one horse but we have other horses We've other, got more of them. yeah we have more but they are not uh, as well excavated as this one so we may have one here but this is still quite messy but so we're... i can see here what's that one of the leg bones and possibly another leg yeah, over there. Another, yeah, a leg bone there. This one is not clear. And, and then another one here. Yes. And what's that? Is that a? Oh, that's the, there that's, are some teeth. Yeah. So we have a head here, and we may have uh, one one horse here because you have a back leg there. Right. So you may be standing on his back <laughs> at the moment. But it just goes to show when you had a Napoleonic hospital. It wasn't just humans that were dying, horses, no, horses were dying, too. horses were dying as well. They were part of the battle also, so we still don't know how, why they died, if it was on the battlefield or afterward, um, but it's, it is clearly linked to the battle because it's in the same context as the amputated limb. So it works with the hospital. And then further on down here, Oh, we've got another another leg here, another yeah, limb there. there. And you have his head here and his spine and the scapula. I see, yeah. And then what on earth is happening here? So that's the area where we had the amputated limbs right. years ago. And under those limbs, there was all those kind of small pieces of iron. We were not sure what it was. It seemed to be some containers, some kind of boxes, but we, we've done some researches, we had some ideas, but this year we were able to measure those boxes. I mean, well, this is the area that we dug when we were here the last time. Yes, it is. And I mean, we got pretty excited about that, didn't we? we but we excited. never believed what was happening on either side. So we had a clue, because in the trenches, the evolution trenches, we had, yeah, we saw there were maybe some uh, uh, horses' bones, some animal bones. So we had some kind of um, maybe uh, there is something happen something is happening just there. So that's why this year we decided to open wider. Sam, you've been in sort of studying battlefield archaeology in England yeah. for a long time. You've never seen anything like this, have you? No, no, absolutely. I mean, what what I think we're looking at is um, debris from battlefield clearance, basically, and and. Working with some of the reenactors actually is what helped us potentially identify some of this stuff here. And what we think we've got is a whole dump of uh, tins from cartridge boxes. Right. So perhaps you've got wounded men coming into the hospital. The first thing you would do, so they can get comfortable on the ground, is take off their cartridge boxes. So, so a, a cartridge box, is, uh, every soldier would have had a cartridge Absolutely. box. Absolutely, it would have sat on the hip carrying all the rounds that he needed for the battle, made out of leather but it has this little tin in the bottom of it with a wooden uh, kind of block that sits on top. So that would have, because it's sort of sitting behind him like that, along with the bayonet, that would be one of the first things to come off. And interestingly, we did have a bayonet frog from last uh, time we were here. We had a Baker rifle bayonet frog. From so there. the frog is the, is the bit, what's that, on the end of the scabbard? Uh, no, it's the bit that connects it to the cross belt. Right, So I it's see. made of bronze or brass, and it sort of hooks it onto the belt. Um, interestingly, you can also probably just see there is another copper alloy object in here. Quite what that is, um, it, it isn't clear at this point, but it may turn out to be, again, something similar. So, Vera, what, what, what are these white tags for? So, these white uh, tags were, made, were put there uh, three years ago because we had to record uh, all those limbs with what we call the photogrammetry. So it's a way to uh, record um, all the artifacts uh, with the height, the measure, and everything that is very accurate. So we can like go back on the field when the field is over, when the excavation is over. So that really will enable us to link this year's work with the we previous... Have, uh, yes, I'm hoping we can have, after that, an entire photogrammetric uh, view of 
all these uh, deposits. So what else have you got to do here then? Three days after the beginning of the um, excavation here on Monday, uh, I was asked to extend a bit the trench. And at the end of the, that day, we were amazed to find some human teeth. So these rumors about a human burial, they're not rumors, they are real. So we have a human burial here. So I know it is early days yet, but we've obviously got the skull in there. Yes. And then one upper arm there, lower arm and a hand. Mm -hmm. Totally. And the upper arm on that side, okay. and his vertebrae coming down there. Exactly. What on earth is that? Yeah, that's what we thought too. We were just uh, trying to clear the skeleton, and suddenly there was this huge bone that appeared in the place where there was supposed to be no bones. And in fact, it's another amputated limb. So, we've, we had our cluster of amputated limbs there. Do, do, can you be sure that this leg does not belong to this person? For the moment we are not sure, and maybe we'll see if there is something missing in the, the, the legs of uh, the, um, the, the dead uh, guy there. Maybe it is his limb. This is a truly significant find for Waterloo, isn't it? How, how many other complete well we don't know that this is complete yet but be. how many other completed skeletons have been found on the battlefield one this is the second so this is quite an enormous discovery and and potentially this is just the beginning of the story because w at the moment he tells us very little we don't know what his sex is, we don't know what his age is, we don't know where he came from, whether he was a, a French a, a wounded person, whether he was of, of the Allied Army. We know virtually nothing, but presumably with, with a bit of time after the dig, we might actually be able to literally put a little bit of flesh on him. Yes, of course, there is, there is uh, an anthropologist who is working with us, uh, which works for the natural uh, science in Brussels. And she will take the remain and all the skeleton, uh, skeleton with her, and she will try to find everything she can about um, this probably soldier. So, I told you we wouldn't be disappointed, didn't I, eh? What do you think about that then? Only the second human burial from Waterloo, and we're just beginning to tell his story. Strange, isn't it, really? I come to a site like this, I can't stop myself being an archaeologist, and I see what they're finding in this trench. And, but I make archaeological observations, and the one thing that really struck me was just how little topsoil there was on this trench. In other words, how little dirt they had to remove to find all this material. We were incredibly lucky that all this material is preserved. And now we've got the skilled archeologists here to rescue that information for the future. Mont Saint-Jean for me is a real high point because what it brings home is the harsh reality of the Battle of Waterloo. You've got those horses in there which looks like they've been shot because they've been wounded. You've got skeletons of soldiers, amputated limbs from, the, from the, the surgery. And to me, that brings home the, the reality of what this battle was like. It's not all fancy uniforms and plumed helmets and you know, sparkling sabres. It was bloody awful work. And what we've got there, we, we, we've got as close now as we ever will to standing on that battlefield while the battle's raging. I mean, you, it's like you, traveling back in time. You think it really will help us to rewrite a big chapter in the battle? I, I think, it, I think it, will help, it will help to understand what happened in the immediate aftermath of the battle, which to be frank is a period which I'm finding more and more interesting. What happened to the bodies, for instance? What happened to the thousands of horses that were killed and wounded? And so Mont Saint-Jean has given us an incredible insight into that, and it's a very rare find. To find a, a it's, not, it's not even really a grave, it's, it's like a disposal yeah. thing. 
on a Napoleonic battlefield is phenomenal. The fact that that person has not been, or doesn't appear to have been, uh, what should we say, he's not been buried with full military honours. No. They've been chucked in a ditch, that's, to put it bluntly, they've been thrown in a ditch. And presumably they must have had so many bodies, yeah. the idea of showing them much respect went out the window, you just got yeah. rid of them. Yeah, they, they spent about 10 days and they brought in local people to, to, to dispose of the dead. And they weren't just burying, they weren't just putting them in holes in the ground, they were burning them. Yeah. Because they, they, you know, there's maybe 15, 20,000 dead bodies out there, thousands of dead horses. They had to dispose of them as quickly as possible. And I've been looking at the accounts of visitors who are coming, including people who were here the day after the battle. But they just they describe the wounded. I mean, the battle's fought on a Sunday. They describe the wounded still being, or some of them still being on the field on the Thursday. Yeah. And it takes at least 10 days to get most of... They must have been finding bodies hidden away in corners for years. Well, I've just come from talking with Tony, and at the back of my mind, I can't help thinking about what we've found on the excavation so far. Principally, the fact that we've actually found human remains. Now, that's a subject which people have got very strong opinions of. And in this instance, potentially, we're looking at somebody who died in combat. Now, I've got two veterans here with me who could see themselves as colleagues of that person in there. And I just wonder, how do they react to the idea of archaeologists digging up human remains? How do you feel about it, Liam? Um, it's quite an emotive thing for me. Uh... To, to think that that might be might be someone that you know similar to people I've served with, who um who didn't you know maybe didn't come home, um and I think we should do everything we can to to give them the dignity and respect and the honour um and if we can if we can identify identify them and and maybe give them some kind of recognition a, a monument a memorial similar to to what you see with the First World War and the Second World War I mean. <clears throat> That would, that would be really important to me. Would you share those views, Ash? Yeah, bang on. And, and Liam and I actually have you know, spoke in length about this. And uh, at first, because I was there when the, the, sort of, um, the first couple of teeth sort of came visible and everybody was sort of a little bit excited, excited that we found something initially. Um, and it's only sort of um, when you kind of come down from that, you realise, wow, that, that, that is, a, is a person to begin with. You know? do, you, do you think that there is a, a, a difference between archaeological excavation of human remains and exhumation of human remains. In other words, you might want to repatriate them. W would you make a distinction between those two processes? Yeah, definitely. And um, having spent some time in uh, Eep and surrounding areas on uh, on Saturday at the weekend, um, uh, seeing the sort of unknown soldiers' uh, uh, graves, and I thought, it, I, you know, this, this, uh, this person was definitely on my mind. Um, and I thought, you know, uh, it would be same as Liam saying, you know, we've discussed this as well. And Liam says, kind of, that's one of our guys. You know, if we looked at it as, as a, from a soldier's point of view, you know, imagine if we'd had to leave our guys in Afghan and Iraq. And, you know, I, th I don't know how I would have felt about that, you know. Um, but you see, from an archaeological point, I mean, I'm an archaeologist. I don't know who that person was. I've never served mm. in combat. They're just another person to me. I would knowing the way that archaeologists react to human remains, I think there's a certain excitement about finding them, but there is always a deep respect. You would never find people, archaeologists, messing around with them. And for me, it's worthwhile digging those human remains up because they have a story. And do you think their story is, is, is a valid reason for digging them up? I think so. I think so. And if we can use use their legacy to improve our knowledge, um, to ensure that things like this don't happen again, and learn from it, um, I think that would be really important. Um, and I know the archaeologists take it very seriously. Um, and yeah, I, I'd like to think that this person could tell us their story, and and we can honour them, you know, with that. Thanks a lot, guys. Well, that's the end of our virtual tour. I hope you've enjoyed what you've seen. We have made some remarkable discoveries and some very thought-provoking ones too. Please consider that we are a charity and we do rely on your donations. So please don't forget the banner at the bottom, which enables you to donate to Waterloo Uncovered.